Uh, yeah, there's a lot of questions now with uh, the virus and what's going on in the country. I can't help but think it's an overreaction to the whole thing. I mean, wow, it's like, you know, man, wow, a lot of questions come to mind. Uh, but that means for some of us, you know, are we going to travel? Like I'm supposed to, you know, we, we all have, not all of us, but we have travel. Like the Robinsons are here from uh, Turkey. You know, I'm supposed to go to India. We have an Easter play coming up. We have students at GGCA, uh, NBCNS that are coming back from Europe. And, uh, you know, all those kind of questions. Uh, through the night, we were on the phone with my uh, John's wife, my daughter, and uh, and hearing what's going on. So it's kind of a new territory for us, you know. But praise God, we're, we're solidly um, uh, happy and contented, at least. I am, I guess. <laughs> okay, so we're going to read from Jeremiah chapter 23 on uh, pastoring people. And this is what we started yesterday morning. <clears throat> and um, how about if we just take and uh, <clears throat> praise the Lord for a few minutes together and praise God and pray to him and is this started the video do we edit it okay don't you wouldn't you recommend based on the last minute that we would edit it okay just checking uh, how about if um, how about we do this let's all stand up uh, go to somebody in the room and have one or two minutes of prayer together Okay.
Yes, Lord. Okay, amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, Cody, now we can start, right? It's been going, right? What? Okay, you had it. Okay. Uh, pastoring people and anger. Let's speak about anger today a little bit. How many like this subject? I'm, I'm angry about it. <laughs> Anger. Okay, this is the end of, uh, we're going to look at Jeremiah 23, and then we're going to look at James chapter 1, and then we're going to look at Acts chapter 7, in the end of Acts 7. So let's uh, use that story, Acts 7, and Stephen being stoned, like as a reference for how people Religious people can become angry. Um, we're speaking online, Uricon, and I thank uh, Hanale for sending me a, an email uh, enjoying the class. And then um, Ken Fires called me yesterday. He enjoyed the class, and it's very encouraging. And also, he loved Pastor Love's class the other day. Last night with Pastor Stan, uh, and being converted, wow, that's a good one. Being converted, being changed, and then Pastor Shabelli teaching, you know that that you can have changes on the outside, like in a prison, but not at the, on the inside of what it means to be really converted. Even Peter. Pastor Stan mentioned, walked with Jesus three years, and then Jesus saying, when you are converted, because it's not going too good right now, <laughs> like nothing's happening, so, but when you are converted. Uh, you know, in church life, people come, and they receive, and they grow, and sometimes, you know, you wonder, is there any real change that's happening? So we have uh, Luke 22, 31, 32, and we have Jeremiah 23 about the pastor and pastoring people and, um, and leading people and how important it is. All right, so um, the unbeliever can be like very, that's like one category of people and um, just to use the illustration of the Acts 7 at the end, turn there with me, please, and just see how, what the elements were for the anger of Acts 7. <clears throat> and this is um, Stephen filled with the Spirit, reviewing the history from the Bible, from Abraham and making a point that God changes things in his plan. Uh, people change. Uh, plan changes. Uh, God does not change, but uh, people have to get adjusted to the changes. And the Messiah, Jesus Christ coming, was outside of their, outside of their picture. So to get adjusted and accept him, um, was what Stephen was saying. You need to get, get, get with God's plan. But historically, you have been people that have been not getting God's plan. You've been disappointed, uh, disobedient. Uh, you didn't get it with Abraham. Even Abraham himself, when he left the year of the Chaldees, he was to travel to the Promised Land, but he stopped in Haran. And, and Stephen is making a point that he didn't get it either, you know. And then they built the tabernacle, and um, then they worshipped idols. And he mentions Molech, chapter 7, verse uh, 43. 
in Refim, Ref, Remphon, the pagan gods, both of those, and they they got it wrong there. And uh, uh, Jacob's sons, he had 12 sons, and they sold one of them in, in, down into Egypt. They got it wrong there. Um, and let's see what other example he gave Moses. Moses was rejected by the Jews when he went back to Egypt to deliver them. They got it wrong there. Then Jesus comes and he is a different kind of rabbi, a savior, messenger. They got it wrong there. So now the people are very angry at uh, Stephen. And there are in a large number of them. So we have in chapter 7, verse 51, he concludes with this, you stiff-necked. What kind of neck? Stiff. stiff. What do you think it means? Stubborn. Stubborn, yeah. The neck not moving, not being flexible. So there was an old man in First Samuel chapter 3, and he was sitting on a chair. He heard about the tabernacle and his sons being Killed, he fell backwards and broke his neck. Uh, so uh, it represents the uh, rebellion, uh, frozen mindset. Uh, they, you know, not a contrite spirit, not broken, not humble, but you know, a stubborn, tough. Religion, religious in this context. Then verse 51, uncircumcised in heart. What does circumcision mean? The flesh, you know, a Jew was to be recognized to be different from a Gentile in the fact that he was circumcised. Uh, like God touching the reproductive organ of a man, it symbolically means that God will change a person's life and that he will be different. And now the point isn't circumcision of the flesh, but of the heart. Uh, Jeremiah said the circumcision of the lips the circumcision of the years, that there would be a difference because God would do this and we would be different people. We are different. The way we listen, the way we talk, the way we worship, the way we live, the way we, bear, we are fruitful as believers, we are different. But these people are Jews, but they're uncircumcised in heart. They may be in flesh, but that can't change my heart. So we are Jews of um, the, we are spiritual Jews in Romans 2, 28 and 29. And so there's a difference. Okay, verse 51. You do always resist the Holy Spirit. And we should be able to say that to ourselves. I believe that I have a habit of resisting the Holy Spirit. I have a message I'm thinking about uh, from this Bishop Ryle about uh, the fallibility of men of God, meaning the mistakes that men of God make, how men of God can be wrong, you know the mistakes that men of God and women of God can make. Wow. I love the theme, and I don't hear much about it, but it's important. I don't know about you. I get some things right, but some things I don't get right. And if you can't say that, and you need to read your Bible more and get it, get it kind of straightened out. I don't feel bad about it. I feel good about it that I can be wrong, you know. I need help, you know, pray for me, you know, counsel me, you know, love me, encourage me. 
Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels, right? And have not. Though I have all prophecies and know all mysteries and though I give my body to be burned and though I give all my goods to feed the poor and I have not, I am nothing and it profits me nothing. I can be wrong. I mean, come on. It's ridiculous. The pride that people have. I am filled with the Spirit. Really? Are you? You know, I am right. You know, it's like, really? Okay. I, I want to believe that. I believe that about us. I'm not walking around like very discouraged and feeling how wrong I am and wrong you are. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that uh, we can get very high and mighty in our little world and, our, and we get angry when anybody would be challenging me. And Stephen is challenging them. So it says here, verse um, 51, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. What's another way of, of saying resist the Holy Spirit? Grieved the Spirit, Ephesians 4, 29. How about another one? Quench, 1 Thessalonians 5. Quenching the Spirit. Uh, let's see. Um, in, in, uh, yeah, despite is Hebrews 10, 29, 26, where it talks about insulting. Kenneth Weiss talks insulting the Holy Spirit and counting the blood of Jesus as like insignificant, not, not valuable, not powerful. That's a insult to God. Uh, how about lying to the Holy Spirit is in Acts 5, 3 and 4 and 5. Lying to the Holy Spirit. Here we have resisting the Holy Spirit, you know. So, uh, you know, so, okay, so we got this. We, I'm kind of going too slow for what I want to say. So there we got, we got, they're, they're angry, verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on them with their teeth. All right, so they are offended by his speech. Uh, they are angry about uh, what he has been saying. They are afraid of losing their religious system. They are ashamed that Jesus Christ has been crucified. They are being blamed for it, for murdering him. It's in this chapter 7, verse uh, uh, 52. And then, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one. Okay, so now turn to James, please, chapter 1. <clears throat> anger, anger. Men and anger. Men, I say men, women are and get angry also, but men are really known for that, that we get very frustrated and uh, can get anger, have a temper, uh, say and do things out of anger. So in church life, um, it can happen. James chapter 1 in verse... Um, <clears throat> Verse uh, 20, 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. So, we have... Wrath of man does do something. What does it do? Let's talk about what the wrath of man does do. What does it do? What? Wrath of man. Serves up strife. Good, good word. Wrath of man. 
All right, destroys life. Wrath of man is a um, way of forcing your will. It's a way of getting your will. It's a way of, uh, it can also be revenge. Wrath of man uh, is emotion. Wrath of man is a, maybe judgment. Wrath of man is vindictive. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. Wrath of man is a very common way of operating. There is anger in families, anger in marriages, anger in church, you know. There's anger in relationships with people. It's a very common thing, you know. If I get angry, if I get mad enough and angry enough, I can intimidate people. If I start throwing things and kicking and cussing and swearing and behaving like that, I can get my way. You guys will run away from me in fear and trembling. I will get my way. Murder is another way. Murdering somebody. What is murder? It's eliminating a person. Hey, I solved my problem. That person is not here anymore. Okay? It's like horrible to think that any of this would be acceptable by us and by God. But actually, God is saying, it is not my way. I don't murder people. I save people. I don't destroy people. I pastor people. I'm not angry with people. I'm leading people. I'm drawing them. I'm ministering to them. I am pastoring them. So you have a church split, and people are angry, and they're behaving like pagans. They're behaving like children. They're, they're behaving with saying things and hurting and wanting to destroy. And anger is driving the, the whole thing in terms of like how people are treating each other and loving each other. And this should not be. So turn now to Jeremiah 20, 23, please. And... Uh, Verse 1, woe unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. They destroy and scatter the sheep. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. They feed my people, but they are also scattering and destroying. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Now, over the years, we have seen a lot of pastors in the ministry and they are awesome people. We mentioned yesterday many of them by name. And it's awesome to see the Spirit of God lead people and use them to speak and teach doctrine and edify and guide people in the faith. Because people want to know not the problems and the talk and the gossip, and the anger, and the wounds, and the hurt. People want to hear truth, and be fed, and be led, and to be guided, and look to God. When you look to Jesus, you become like Jesus. When we follow God, we become like God, right? We grow in grace. So, verse uh, 3 and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. So we have uh, the scattering and then God drawing people. And I have seen it 
lately, God drawing people. Like we have Sandy here, who's here this morning, and that's amazing. God, and there's another brother la last night, Ed, and then another, you know, Steve, and different ones that are drawn by God, and they're hungry, and they want to be fed and led in peace and in love, the nature of God, you know, the Spirit of God, drinking, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, drinking the Spirit and being in fellowship with a lot of love and a lot of patience, a lot of wisdom, like Josh and Kara over here. Actually, there's a lot of new people that have come into the church, you know, and good things happening, but it doesn't happen by, by, um, by our personality, by our reaction, by our disappointments. When I have a personal disappointment, I want to be careful not to minister that to you. I don't want to, you, it doesn't help you if you know my problems. It says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus and him crucified. And I am determined not to know anything among you, 1 Corinthians 2, 1, except Christ and him crucified. Uh, but it's got to be also more than just Bible knowledge. It has to be the ministry of God, the spirit of God that is working to edify and draw people to himself. Sometimes when on this level it's very difficult, it might be the best time where God is pouring out and ministering Christ to people. And we're learning in our difficult time to hear what God has to say to us and lead us in peace. Colossians 3 and verse 16, that he leads us in peace. Let the word of Christ dwell on you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. And let the peace of God rule in your heart. That's beautiful. Uh, he can build your capacity for God so that in a bad marriage, you're able to minister in a bad marriage. He's able to give, minister to you in your difficulty with children. He's able to minister to you so that you have a ministry when you have problems with your children or at work or your health or whatever it might be because he's a good shepherd and he gives us a way of escape. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, we spoke on that recently. Okay, verse 4. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more. Number one, fear no more. That's amazing. Fear no more. Like, if I can hear from God, I don't hear fear the coronavirus, you know, in a way. I don't live in the same kind of fear that other people have. When uh, we get older and we realize we're going to die someday and maybe, maybe sooner than we realize, it's like, wow, that's amazing. Like you, you don't have the same kind of fear because you are being edified in the, you know. Verse 4, then it says, nor be dismayed, ultimately disappointed, ultimately let down ultimately, you know, discouraged, dismayed, nor be dismayed. I love it that we can get in the habit of looking at reality in the face. And we can visit somebody who had a stroke and realize this could happen to me. Uh, somebody who lost uh, something precious realized that could happen to me. So doctrine... Uh, teaches us that we live by the creator and not the creation. But if I don't have the creator, then I just have creation. And this is where I'm dismayed, I'm disappointed, I live in some kind of fear, and there's something lacking. But when we live with the creator, it says, 
he opens his hand and satisfies every living thing. That when God is our guide, we have God. We have found God. Psalm 73, neither do I have anything in heaven but you and you alone, and none do I desire on the earth but only you. In verse 26, I almost slipped, my foot almost slipped, and when I went into the house of God, the sanctuary of God, I understood their end. And I realized that I'm really built on the right foundation. So this is what pastoring does for people. It helps us relate to God and find our own relationship with God the pastor can help me, inspire me, instruct me, help me open the Bible, Acts 8, verse 20. How will I understand who is speaking except someone to teach me? I have no need for a natural teacher, 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, but we have an anointing, and we don't need any man to teach me like a professor at the university. What I need is somebody to teach me like Jesus Christ taught his disciples and Paul taught the Ephesians. But notice something. The Ephesians were very good, very good believers. The Ephesians were very good. But I have something against you. You have left your first love in Ephes Revelation chapter 2. They were taught a three-year Bible school at Ephesus. They were taught by the Apostle Paul. That must have been a great school. Three years with the Apostle Paul in Bible college. Can you imagine? He had a great school making a great church. But I have something against you. You have left your first love. Uh, so pa pastors, and I'm so talking to all the pastors in Europe and wherever this tape goes, not knowing much about it. I mean, in one way, all of us were all learning and growing, but how important it is to pastor people and how precious it can be when they start to hear from God and love their Bible and love each other and how better it is than to live in anger and manipulation and control and what it means to serve and love people and help them grow up and become mature in Christ. Verse 4 describes four things that will happen to them. They will fear no more. They will not be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking. And actually, they, they will be fed. Verse for they will be fed, they will fear no more, they'll not be dismayed, and they'll not be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, this is the Messiah, and a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, Israel shall dwell safely and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. This is one thing that is lacking in our world. It's righteousness. It might even be in the church. It's righteousness. In the church people are drawn to entertainment but our ministry is to draw people to righteousness. In the world, people are drawn to um, relativism and situational judgments on things and opinions and what do they call the crazy, uh, what is it, identity politics or something, you know, and all that stuff, you know, and what I feel and what I, who I am, I'm a man or a woman or whatever I am. And it's like all this foolishness but the church draws people to righteousness. That's our food. What's right, what's true, what's edifying, what's love, what's of the spirit, 
what's, a, what's it mean to be a servant, what it means to love each other, what it means to forgive, what it means to suffer. It's amazing. So, uh, pastoring people. And people need help in every area. I'm reading a book, I think I mentioned it, about how Amish people raise their family. And, um, and the, the world that we live in is called, they call it helicopter parenting. It's when the parents hover over the children and say, are you happy? Are you happy? You know, I hope you're happy. I want to make you happy. And the Amish people are not doing that. Like the family is doing their duty, their work, the kids are fun, have playing, play, they're learning to work, learning to enjoy it, they're respectful, they're learning to be responsible. And they never, they don't ask, are you happy? Their children are happy. Their children find the joy of work and relationship and extended family. It's like a beautiful comparison that is worthwhile mentioning. The church is a little bit like this, that we are not caring about is our church successful or happy or many people are coming or we love, love each other in a touchy-feely way. No, we are looking for something deeper and greater and more powerful and edifying and encouraging and developing and growing and we'll be happy enough because uh, God is with us. So uh, that's our uh, picture here of Jeremiah 23. Let's go move ahead for a few more minutes. And it says, <clears throat> uh, um, let's see, verse 32. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. By their lightness. That my people are erring by their dreams, by their lies, and by their lightness. Lightness. Nothing deep, nothing profound, nothing true, nothing wise, just lightness. Yet I, will, I sent them not, nor commanded them, therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. And when this people or the prophet or priest shall ask you, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? You shall say, What burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. You know what it means? They come to you saying, what is the burden of the Lord? And then the prophet is to say, like, very seriously, what burden? You know, I'm forsaking you. Forget about it. I'm not playing your games, you know. I, yeah, I'm fed up. You know, you are sick. You are, I don't know, you, you're not serious. You're not serious with me. It's like in America, we have this phrase, God bless America, and we love it, the song and everything. But God could say to our whole nation, you know, we should sing God bless America, and God could say, what? Bless America? I don't even know who America is. I am so fed up with you people and the way you are living and the way you are walking and talking and doing your stuff. I don't even know who you are. You know, it's kind of a sarcastic, forceful comment to a group of people that think they're right, but they're so shallow and they don't have it. So that's the idea there. And I think we, I think we can close with that. It's like such a great note to close on. <laughs> like, it's amazing, isn't it? Okay, so... Uh, Let's pray. Father, we pray that we could be very much edifying, encouraging, loving, guiding, anointed, effective. We could be wise counselors to people that are 
suffering and struggling, that youth ministry would be a ministry of truth for young people to find Christ and get, get grounded that the way of the cross would be not be a foreign thing as sacrifice and suffering could be something that we could embrace because of the cross. For our churches everywhere, for the ministry to be a great blend of being true and serious and wise and filled with love and joy and personal relationships. In France, where we see that, God bless the brothers and sisters in France with a lot of joy, a lot of freedom, a lot of wisdom. In Germany, bless Pastor Stefan Stein and Mindy. In Finland, a lot of freedom, a lot of joy and fellowship, small groups, edification, young people finding Christ and the truth of the word of God in Sweden, in Poland, in Hungary, in the Ukraine, in Turkey, Lord, in Serbia, in Austria, we pray, in the UK, and send Bible college students here to MBCNS in your perfect will, and minister to us and lead us as pastors that we would learn this kind of love and that we would not do the will of God out of we would not do God's will, could, could never do his will by anger, but do it by wisdom and truth in the inner man with love. In Jesus' name, amen. Great, God bless you.